In 1980, when asked why he wrote the Dune novels, Frank Herbert had a chilling answer. I wrote the Dune saga because I had this idea that charismatic leaders ought to come with the warning label, may be dangerous to your health. Throughout his whole life, Herbert believed heroes were a recipe for disaster. Even if we found a real superhero, he thought that flawed mortals would eventually gather around such a leader and form a power, and this power would somehow be abused. Hitler, Churchill, or Stalin, he saw them all as products of this dangerous human flaw. And with his Dune novels, he actually warned us that a society relies on a single charismatic and powerful leader is in great danger. For him, Paul Atreides is not a savior. He is not a chosen one. His destiny is a fabricated myth. It's a belief. It's a lie. And I want to explain why. At first glance, Paul Atreides seems to follow the classic hero's journey. As the heir of a powerful family, he's thrown into an unfamiliar world, witnesses his father's murder, narrowly escapes death, and becomes a savior figure among the native people of Arrakis. Yet his story challenges traditional ideas of heroism. His status as the chosen one is also his fatal flaw. And unlike the classic heroes destined to save the world, Paul's story explores the terrible burden of this destiny. Actually, at the beginning of the story, we learn that Paul's existence is a mistake. The Bene Gesserit has been breeding humans for generations and centuries to get this special Kwisatz Haderach, and it was not supposed to be him. He was supposed to be a girl who marries Fade Rautha, and their child was supposed to be the chosen one. So he is the one who wasn't supposed to happen, but he did anyway. And despite not being the planned chosen one, he still just takes that destiny and goes with it. First of all, as the Duke Leto's son, he was always destined to take his father's place. He spent his entire childhood preparing for this role. And on top of that, his mother was a Bene Gesserit, and she trained him in their ways too. Now think about it from Paul's perspective. You are the Duke's heir with all that pressure. You've trained by the Bene Gesserit, and then you've arrived to Dune and hear all these prophecies about who you are supposed to become, and you are just a 15-year-old kid. Can you imagine the pressure? It must be unbearable. He's practically drowning in others' expectations. This is also where his dreams and visions get so intense he starts to believe they're real, that they're going to happen. He sees future version of himself. He sees himself leading a holy war. People are chanting his name as they head into battle. It's overwhelming for him and he wants to fight against it. This isn't the destiny he wants, but he feels helpless because he's not even sure what choices he'll end up making. The doubt eats him alive. So what does someone drowning in doubt need, especially a supposed savior? That's exactly what Paul gets from the Fremen, a blind faith. At one point of the story, Paul tries to downplay his importance and says, I am not the Messiah. I am not here to lead. Yet Stilgar answers like this, you are too humble to say so, exactly as written. This kind of belief is actually dangerous. Of course, Paul's background commands respect, how he holds himself or how he talks. It's clear that he's got something special. The second he speaks, you realize he's way more mature and aware than he looks. And that kind of thing really resonates with the Fremen who are isolated, um, superstitious, and desperate for a leader. But the problem is, Paul's natural charisma and the Fremen's hunger for a savior, it's the perfect recipe for him to feel entitled. Uh, but it's also a, a vicious cycle, because the more the Fremen believe Paul is the Messiah, the more his own doubts and anxieties are overridden, pushing him toward the role he fears. And throughout the story, we see that transformation. As Paul becomes more deeply connected with the Fremen, the young boy groomed for dukedom disappears. In his place rises Kwisatz Haderach, a savior. Fremen see that as a savior, yes, a miracle. But what they don't realize is that it's the result of generations of brainwashing by a powerful order that's been manipulating the galaxy for millennia. The Bene Gesserit, through their Missionaria Protectiva, have molded beliefs for thousands of years. Yet the Fremen believe it wholeheartedly, and more importantly, so does Paul. And in his own way, he does what must be done. This is the most important difference between Paul and many other traditional chosen ones. Unlike the characters who strive for personal growth, Paul's focus isn't on becoming a better person. He's less concerned with his moral compass and more driven by what he believes must be done. And this kind of determination carries risks because those who do what they see as necessary can easily slip into villainy, or at the very least, become responsible for countless deaths. This is Paul's tragedy. He's swept up by the crowds, embracing a narrative written long before him and accepts his destiny as the savior of his people. Yet, beneath it all, like many leaders in the real world, he harbors a deeper, more personal desire. In Paul's regard, it's vengeance. He wants revenge against House Harkonnen for killing his father, and to achieve this, he's willing to manipulate the Fremen and their faith in him. Don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting Paul is consciously scheming to exploit the Fremen. 
but deep down he knows that the only way to get revenge is by leading them. If you remember when Paul first envisions possible futures, he sees paths where both he and his mother survive without needing the jihad. Yet, Paul rejects them because they don't grant him a path with his revenge. The only path with the Fremen promises his vengeance, but it would inevitably trap him within the jihad. So, all the choices he makes along the way lead him closer to defeating the Harkonnens and avenging his father, and he knew it. Remember his words to his mother at the beginning of the part two, where he says that he believes in revenge? Even at the end of the movie, fueled by the power he gets from the Fremen, he declares war on the Imperial forces amassed in the planet's orbit. Lead them to paradise, he commands. What an icy expression. It's a call for sacrifice, disguised as salvation, a demand for his followers to die so he can win. And this sparks the Holy War, a conflict that brings devastation to billions. How ironic is it? His own actions forge the very future he feared and sought to prevent as a child. But what for? Is it really to liberate the Fremen or for something else? This actually makes Paul a real disaster for the Fremen. Far from leading them to paradise, Paul leads them into the hell of an interstellar holy war in which even those who survive will remain scarred, traumatized, and will no longer be able to find happiness. Because while the Fremen wanted their savior to ecologically restore their barren planet, Paul leads them away from home, having completely hijacked their belief system, and the loyal warriors have shifted from freedom fighters to religious fanatics. And Chani was aware of it. Especially in the part two, her slight deviation from the book's portrayal emphasizes her belief that the Fremen should fight for their own liberation rather than passively awaiting an off-world savior. So actually, her perspective prevents the Fremen from becoming one-dimensional followers of a prophesied figure. But of course, her efforts alone aren't enough. This is where Paul's story reminds us a harsh truth. No human, no matter how heroic they may seem, can save us. They are not all-knowing, and ultimately, they do what serves their own deepest desires. But can we blame everything on Paul? No. Because he would never have gained such power without the unstable political climate and the manipulations of the Bene Gesserit. Their eugenic breeding program molded him, thrusting him into a savior role he never chose. If it wasn't him, it could have been another person who became the Messiah. This underscores the message that Frank Herbert weaves throughout the Dune universe. The core issue isn't limited to individuals. It's the very system that produces such figures and elevates them to dangerous heights. The same system ravaged the once verdant Dune and transformed it into the desolate Arrakis. It acknowledges its flaws, yet eagerly awaits a promised savior to fix them. And that's where the tragedy of Paul Atreides lies. So if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a comment, give a like, and click to subscribe. Your support will greatly help the mysterious algorithm works its magic. And if you want to support me personally, you can join the channel by using the join button. See you next time.